first senator, student senator Kate Bidwell, who's here for the first time. Please join me in welcoming her to the Senate and all of our activities. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, we have a big agenda today, and so we are going to get started. The first thing we do is to um, approve the minutes. And oh, I need to tell you a couple of things. One is, is that as always, we are now live on the web. And so if you want to speak, please identify yourself and I will scamper around with a microphone to um, get you um, on the tape. Um, the second thing is, as you've noticed, that one of our projectors is busted, and that means that we only have one screen. And so, is everybody in the back? Kelly, can you see this more or less? Thank you. Can you guys back there? Thank you. Okay. So, first thing we do is we approve the minutes. Um, the minutes are um, quite a document this time. Um, many, 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 many pages. 18, in fact. This is half of the first page. We can scroll through it, but I hope that you have looked over it. And so I would like to ask, are there any corrections or changes? If not, I'd like to hear a motion for approving them by a Senate member. Peter Keyes raises his hand and says he approves, and we have a second. Thank you very much. And we will now formally vote to adopt them. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, please say nay. All abstain, please say abstain. So we've accepted these minutes. Thank you very much. And I want to say a specific and deep thank you to Chris Prosser, who um, works through these. And this is not an easy task to do, to make them understandable and make them archival, too. So. I, I appreciate all his work. <laughs> and apparently so do the rest of us. The next thing we have is the standard State of the Union message. Unfortunately, President LaRiviere is not with us today because he's um, at a funeral and Provost Dean is out of town. So the President has asked his executive, senior executive assistant, Dave Cuban, to say a few words. And I now turn this over to Dave. Thank you. It, it really will just be a few words. Um, the President just wanted me to convey, as Nathan did, that he is at the memorial service for Harold Schnitzer, um, a, an individual, an Oregonian that Richard has characterized publicly as an Oregonian for the ages. Richard is there with Judith Baskin, Deborah Green, Larry Fong, uh, from Jordan Schnitzer and Museum of Art, and several other faculty members and staff uh, to memorialize um, the passing of this great Oregonian. I mention this in part also because late in the day today, I'll be coming to you as the chair of the Distinguished Service Awards Committee. And if you've been around for at least a decade, you know that uh, Harold Schnitzer was the recipient of this high award in year 2001. He was known at that time not only for his philanthropy within the state of Oregon broadly, but also for his founding gifts for the Judaic Studies program here at the University of Oregon. So Richard wanted me to convey his regrets that he can't be here. Another topic that I want to mention on Richard's behalf, but I won't do justice in the way that he would have to the high honor that this represents, but I want to make sure that we have conveyed our congratulations to Professor Jerry Wichman for achieving the very <coughs> high honor of election to the National <coughs> National Academy of Sciences. Um, we, th that is a very distinct honor. Um, we have several of them in our, among our faculty, one among our current sitting group here, but it is a very rare and very well-deserved honor. Richard would have done more justice to that, but I wanted to get it on the record for the archives. The other thing that I thought I would convey is, uh, on Richard's behalf, a tradition that he has asked that we implement, and we will, and it, it will be a tradition that we are calling You Owe Remembrance. And one of the things that, again, those of us who've been in these settings for the time
time since the assembly was disbanded, one of the things that we lost that we know that the assembly used to do was to recognize and acknowledge those faculty members and staff members who had passed away. <coughs> so Richard has asked that we implement, and we will on May the 25th, the first of what we call UO Remembers. And in a very brief reading of the names over by the Pioneer Mother, we will memorialize <coughs> those <coughs> emeriti, those retired faculty members, those students, board members who have passed away. And then I will convey one other very brief comment that I know Richard would have touched on. <coughs> he doesn't always comment on the agenda per se, but he did want you to know that uh, he is pleased to see you taking up the discussion of the resolution to support Senate Bill 742. And he asked me to, and I, Nathan must have, may have distributed to you already, the letter that he signed on March 3rd in support of this. And as of today, entered into testimony in the Senate, further support for this bill, and he has been on record in support of the DREAM Act. So I feel a little tentative about conveying a presidential endorsement of a resolution. I will simply be very informal and say he was pleased to see this on your agenda. And I'll leave it at that. I'll be back before you at the end of the day to nominate our three distinguished service awards, but. Uh, Nathan told me I had 90 seconds, and I think I took 89. Thanks, Dave. Yes. Someone watching on the web, we've just been informed that somebody watching on the web has um, Twittered us to tell us that the sound is not coming through. Um, so I'm just letting the, the technical wizards in the back know about that. They didn't say they wanted you to say it again, okay? But by the way, let me just give you some um, quick, two quick points. The, the motion that Dave was referring to that the president has sent a letter, in fact, he sent two and we'll show you these in a minute, is this motion here. We will get to that in, in a few minutes. The other thing is, is that I want to give you a heads up that later on in the agenda, we have a section, as Dave mentioned, on the Distinguished Service Award, and that, because of the nature of that award, requires us to go into executive session, which will mean that everybody who is not a senator must leave the room for maybe 10 minutes, and I apologize for that, but we'll be talking about people individually, and it's not a good thing for us to be doing this in, uh, in public. <coughs> and we will be turning off the web video and sound. John? Uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong in terms of procedure. Uh, if the president or his representative uh, makes a state of the university, a statement, uh, are we then allowed to intervene, make a comment? Uh, my comment would be, and David, I may not have heard you completely correctly, uh, but you said something about the president is not, it doesn't want to, doesn't like to, doesn't like to make a habit of commenting on the agenda or something like that. And I, I want to just have the Senate start to think about it, I'm sure it already has. We want the president to be, we want the Senate and the president to be together in shared governance. And I've heard before that sometimes the president might think that, that, that in order to allow us to exercise our authority, there needs to be some distance, and I at least think the opposite may be true. And I would welcome uh, comments by the president on our agenda because I feel completely confident that if I don't agree with the comment, I'll still be my independent self. And I wonder if there's anything you should say on that or not. Well, that's a point well taken. And I'm not sure that I, I, I may have expressed it in a manner that was a bit more gingerly than he might have. I didn't want to, um, I don't want to overstate his reticence. Um, but it's a good topic, that, that sort of free exchange. Um, I guess what I was saying, he's not telling the Senate how to vote. Um, he wanted the Senate to know that he had already taken a stand, but he's not telling the Senate how to vote. Thank you both. Anybody else? If not, let's move on to the first of several motions and actions we have to take today. 
This first one is going to take a little bit. This is legislation to adopt the new Senate bylaws. The motion is to adopt them. Let me give you some background. The background is that about a year ago, the Senate, uh, the statutory faculty adopted a new constitution. As part of that, we were asked, the Senate was asked to rewrite and update its bylaws. These bylaws were first written by a couple of people, including myself. They were then reviewed by a number of people, again reviewed by the Senate Executive Committee, sent out for comments by the Senate itself, and now we're bringing it up for your approval, or at least for discussion, and hopefully for your approval if you feel comfortable with me. What I'd like to do, because there's many pages of this, is to not so slowly, but to go over what changes have occurred. So you feel really comfortable with, with the new bylaws and that you can ask some specific questions. Is that okay with everybody? So I'm just going to now scroll through the bylaws and highlight for you the major changes. Now, the word highlight is probably the wrong thing because this is the draft that's on the web and there's eight different articles. What you see highlighted in yellow are, are, are sections that are taken directly from the Constitution and we cannot change them. Anything that's not highlighted in yellow, you can change if you don't like it, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through. Okay, it worked. So, I apologize. Let's go through the first article. Not that it can be changed, but so you can understand what's going on. The first article states the authority and scope of this Senate. The way the Senate, I'll get to your question in a minute, Marie. The way the Senate is organized is that the statutory faculty are is the primary governance body at this university. It doesn't meet very often, so therefore it has delegated day-to-day -day governance authority to this body. And essentially, and that comes from, from the original charter and from a number of interpretations of that charter. So, Marie, you had a question? Thank you. Are there any questions on this first part? Not that it can be changed, but I want you to understand it. The second part has to do with membership and election processes. That too comes straight out of the Constitution and cannot be changed, but it basically talks about a portion of the Senate. The Senate has been reapportioned starting next year. Um, the terms of office, which is two years, which we all know, the election process, which voting rights and procedures, who votes, who can't. All of this is stated explicitly in the Constitution. Um, it was decided not to repeat all of that verbiage in this document. Article 3, Rules and Procedures. The first article of that cannot be changed because it comes from the Constitution again, and it basically says the Senate can adopt any rules and procedures it wants. And afterwards, in the rest of this article, the Senate then we now list what those rules and procedures are. And it basically is that we follow Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised. It's actually, it's Robert's grandfather, great-grandchildren or something like that, because Robert's been gone for a while. Um, we talk about how the rules are, that can be deviated, but in fact, um, all of this, there's no change from the current standard, the current bylaws. It's just rewritten slightly. The agenda, however, has been changed. Now, if you remember, the Senate for many years has run an agenda by which the motions have been left to the end of the meeting, and therefore sometimes we don't get for, to them. The Senate has changed that for this particular year and has actually pushed the business end of the meeting to the top. 
what this says, and if you remember, we've had to have resolutions to change that agenda sequence because it was written in the bylaws. In this version of the bylaws, the motions and all the action stuff is at the top of the agenda. Otherwise, the agenda is the same. Marie, did you have a question? Marie of the Tuli Mathematics. I just have a, yeah, I guess it's a question. I pre I just took it straight from, this is the document that was placed on the web, and I think 3.1 is what we just discussed. Okay. There's 3.1, Marie. It's basically the Senate shall adopt its own rules and procedures. It's taken straight out of the Constitution. Okay. Okay, so the agenda basically lists what the different items are, new business, open discussion, reports, notice of motions, et cetera, et cetera. This is the way we've been running business here for the last year and a half and we're just now institutionalizing it. Then there's a bit about how Senate meetings are run and access to the Senate floor. None of this has changed dramatically, and it's all in the Constitution. There's a little section on visitors just to make sure that visitors feel welcome. Um, attendance, this is no different than what we had before, which is that we have to keep an up-to-date list and. Any senator who doesn't come for two, um, two meetings in any one term has to go to all my lectures. Um, then there's a quorum. The quorum is no different. Okay. And then there's Senate motions and how to deal with Senate motions. Now, this has been rewritten a little bit and expanded just to make clear what one has to do to make a motion. I, I included this in this in the bylaws because Everybody who wants to write a motion and generally has never written a motion before, and it's good to have this written down rather than to keep asking a new Senate president, and each new Senate president might have a slightly different view of how it runs. So we've just put, put our standard operating practices into writing. And that ends. Oh, now. Section 3.8, this is an important section, and this is actually a change that has come down from the current Constitution. And it basically says that the president has the right to, um, that the Senate can do anything it wants, and the president has the right to veto it, and he has 60 days to do so. Now, written into this is the fact that there are policies legislation and resolutions, and I need to give you a heads up that the Constitution itself is being revised and that this section may have to change if the Constitution is changed. But in general, the idea is that what the Senate does, it does, and that the President, if he chooses, to, if he believes or she believes that it's not in the best interest of the university to accept the action of the Senate, has 60 days to officially veto it. We have a section on Distinguished Service Awards and Honorary Doctorates. That's what we're going to be doing in a little bit. That's the same section as was written into the old bylaws. And there's just a section in here on how you modify the bylaws. Because if we choose to change them, we should have a section of how to do that. Then there's the issue of Senate officers. We have several sections about the Senate president, about the vice president, and the president-elect. And it basically. Um, puts into writing the processes that we have had, some of which, because they were not in writing, became contentious a year and a half ago. And so we're just putting into writing what happens if somebody re decides to resign from a position, what the process is to replace that person. And it puts into writing explicitly that the 
person who is elected Senate vice president is also elected to a separate position called president-elect. Now, the only change in this is a change which you need to think about, but let me tell you what it is and what the rationale is, and that is that the Senate, for years and years and years, has elected a new Senate vice president at the end of the academic year. That person was immediately vice president throughout the summer and through the next following year and became president the following, a year later. The Senate passed a motion a year ago, a year and a quarter ago, stating that the election for the vice president should occur in the fall. The rationale for that was that the Senate vice president, that some, that the student senators were not really chosen until the fall, and that the student senators, because there's five of them and they're a significant constituency, should have the right to vote on the president for the Senate. The Senate approved that. We are proposing that it moves back to the spring, and the reason is that we really need a vice president in the summer. We need to have a person who is up to speed and helps the president and actually can become president if we don't if the president chooses to resign or something happens to that president. So that's a change you need to be aware of. Okay? I'm sorry this takes so long. I have put in here we have put in here a, an, a point about the Senate executive coordinator and what the job is of that executive coordinator in the previous bylaw, in the current bylaws, the term is Secretary of the Senate. So we've just updated it and added new responsibilities to that particular position. And we've added a point about the parliamentarian, because as we all know, we need a parliamentarian. Um, then there's a section, as there has been in the past, about internal standing committees of the Senate. Let me just give you a quick overview of this. We have committees that are called university standing committees, which are like committee on, on courses and the um, campus planning committee and the IAC, the Intercollegiate Athletic Committee. All of those are campus-wide committees. We also have five internal Senate committees which help run the Senate. Those five committees are the Senate Budget Committee, the Senate Executive Committee, the Senate Nominating, Senate Rules, and the Committee on Committees. Those committees were written into the bylaws, and so we're just writing them into the bylaws now. The only change to these committees, besides just explaining a little bit more detail what they do, is the change that's here in the Senate Executive Committee. That change consists of changing the membership of the committee and actually increasing it. The current bylaws say that the Senate Executive Committee um, only consists of the Senate President, Vice President, and the Secretary of the Senate, who's now the Executive Coordinator. In this version, it adds a number of new people on it so that all the constituencies in the Senate can be um, represented in the Senate Exec. And the Senate Exec is an important committee because it actually sets the agenda for this meeting. And it's important that we have a wide range of viewpoints. We also put in at the end that the university president, to maintain close communication with the Senate, the university president shall be invited to Senate com executive committee meetings as well. Okay, Just to increase c communication. It's not required all the time. The rest of this particular section is um, the same with a little bit of clarity introduced into the verbiage. So all five committees. Article six is the Academic Council. This is the new council that was established by the um, Constitution. It consists of members of the chairs of all the major academic committees on campus, such as the Graduate Council, Undergraduate Council, Scholastic Review, et cetera. And as you have heard, they actually play a good role here in bringing academic wisdom to this and knowledge to this, these proceedings. In any way, it can't be changed. But it, there, it's in here. Finally, 
there's two other sections. One is university standing committees, and these are established by Senate legislation, and there's nothing different here than was in the Senate bylaws, except that a couple of sections have been moved around and the wording improved, but it essentially talks about appointed and elected university standing committees. These are committees that report directly to the Senate. And it adds, actually adds a section on university standing committees that other stakeholder groups besides faculty have full rights of participation on these committees, including voting rights. And the last section is the Inter Institutional Faculty Senate, of which we have three members, and this is included with no change. That is the new, that is the new bylaw, set of bylaws. So I'd like to open it up now, and I apologize for taking so long. I'd like to open it up now for conversation and discussion and any input, any suggested changes, anybody feel uncomfortable with some sections of it. And as usual, I would like you to tell us who you are, please. Uh, Dean Walton, University of Oregon Libraries. Um, clarification on the issue regarding student voting. The student members of the Senate who are here at the end of the year, they can still vote even though they're leaving for the vice president, correct? Correct. Okay. Any other comments, suggestions, any amendments, changes to the wording? I will let you tell you now that it's almost certain that the Constitution will be updated in a way that will have to make, will make this document change. It may change significantly, it may not change significantly. Whatever changes occur will have to be included in this, and so it'll have to be revised. But I'm sure my, my colleague, Robert Keir, who will be Senate President next year, when all of these changes start to be discussed and go into effect, will bring you up to date on these changes. Right, Robert? Absolutely, Robert says. Thank you. Well, if I don't hear any further comment, um, I'd like to bring this to a vote. Is everybody comfortable with that? So what we're going to do is we're going to vote on these bylaws, OK? And so what we're going to do is do the standard voting. So all in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say nay. All abstain, please say abstained. One abstention. I did not hear any no votes. The rest are yes. So we have passed these bylaws. The bylaws will go into effect immediately. Thank you very much. I want to thank the Senate Executive Committee, by the way, for all their very hard work. And I want to single out um, our parliamentarian, Paul Simons, for helping us repeatedly and extensively throughout this process. He's done a fantastic job. Well, now that you've given your thank yous, Nathan, I would like to thank you because this, when I first saw the copy of the bylaws before the process began, and now that I compare it to this copy, it's a phenomenal amount of work. And I have to admit that I personally could not have done it. And I don't know if anybody else here could have. You can say later whether you think you could have or not. But I know that I could not have done it. It uh, is an amazing amount of work that has gone into this. And Nathan has done the lion's share of it. So I just want to formally thank him um, for working beyond the call of duty on this. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that totally unnecessary statement. But it was much appreciated. All right, we go move on. We will have these posted ASAP. Um, the next thing we will do is to talk about the resolution on tuition equity, DREAM Act, Measure 742, I will ask the two students who have been champions of this, um, Zach Stark McMillan and um, Jill Torres, to come up, introduce themselves, and tell us exactly what 742, the DREAM Act, 
and this particular motion is all about. Hello, everybody. My name is Jill Torres. I am a graduate student in the College of Education. I am currently training to be a teacher. So that's a little dicey right now, but hopefully it will get better. And I've been a student at the U of O since 2006. I did my undergraduate here in psychology and Spanish. And I am currently a GTF for education reform in some sorts and different communication for support to the community on education issues. Oh, I'm Zachary Sarkis Mellon, uh, the student senator on the Senate and the Senate president of the student Senate. That was confusing. <laughs> yeah. No, go for it. You, you know way more better than I do. Well, we come to you today for tuition equity. This is actually taken from a resolution passed by city council for the DREAM Act probably about a year ago. So this. Um, is the basis for the different portions of the resolution here. And should we scroll through the resolution? Or does everybody have a copy of it? Everybody has seen it? Yeah. Let's put it up there. Yeah. OK. And so seven bi or Senate Bill 742 is actually in hearing today at the House level and was passed by Oregon Senate a few weeks ago. And what the bill basically does, sure. It provides in-state tuition for undocumented students who have been going through the school system and have been accepted to the college level. This does not provide financial aid, as would the DREAM Act. And this is, you know, there are several sections of it here. But basically, the goal of this bill is to provide an equitable solution for students who would have to pay three times the amount for going to college. And so you think about how much do we pay for in-state tuition, then there's out-of-state tuition, and then there's out-of-country tuition, which is you know roughly about 20,000, 21,000 per year. If you are undocumented, you have to pay 21,000 and are not eligible for financial aid. And you think about the students who have gone to school in the Oregon school system, have been raised here, have been brought up here, and then you know, come your senior year, you find out that you're not eligible to go to college. You know, your family can't afford this, and you can't pay to get financial aid. You're not eligible for it. So this is basically how I see it and how a lot of folks that I've talked to have seen it, is a way to provide a manner for students to go into higher education. This would provide a big chunk of students in our community a way to get an advanced degree. And, um, you can see here the different aspects of it. So let's go on. Do we need to go over any of this? Just keep it short and sweet. Y'all can read it. Um, so it's not necessarily a cost to the university and that we are not paying for students to go here. We're just not charging as much as we would. That's a question that comes up a lot, is the university is not actually paying anything to have students come here. And a lot of folks see this as you know, human rights interest. Others see it. Fiscally, we'd be generating a lot more income in some aspects. The students who wouldn't be able to pay any tuition will now be able to pay a reduced tuition. And again, this does not deal with um, financial aid. This is not providing financial aid and basically just makes it possible for students to achieve a higher education. And working in the Eugene 4J school district for a few years through University of Oregon Mecha, a lot of students are greatly impacted by this. It's not just the students who have issues of, you know, I can't go to college, why am I here? I, you know, what are my options in the future? You have two 4.0 students and one of them does not have the opportunity to pay for college. You know, it affects all the students in the class, it affects their friends, it affects the families that are in the schools. You know, and as a teacher, how do you, you know, tell a student, oh, I'm preparing you to go to college, but that's not necessarily a reality for them. And, you know, this doesn't necessarily delve into a whole bunch of different issues that you know, folks might like to address. But um, basically, why we decided to bring this to the Faculty Senate is you know, part of what I do for education is I try to find ways to improve outreach to the Latino community and outreach to different underrepresented communities in the area. And if we're doing all of this work as a university to outreach to students, you should go to college, you should go to college, 
I feel like it's also part of our responsibility to show support as educators and people in the education system to bring students up here and to make it a reality for more students. And to clarify, this is for students that have graduated from Oregon high schools. Um, so they're, they're people that, students we've already invested in as um, Oregon citizens and just continuing the investment instead of dropping it and not allowing them to go to into higher education. So just to let you know, what we're voting on here is this three sets of sections, okay? So we're supporting this motion, okay? So I now want to open this up to the floor for any discussion. Before, uh, I should, uh, let me just, it's important for me to show you this, so I apologize for going sideways here. Um, where is it? Here it is. The president of the university, Richard LaRiviere, who I believe has testify, has been, or testified this morning in front of the House Rules Committee, testified and submitted this letter, which we've posted on the web, and it's signed by both him and the president-elect of the ASUO, Ben Exner. Okay, basically supporting Senate Bill 742. Um, President LaRiviere has also signed another letter of support for 742 in co collaboration with um, Ed Ray, the president of OSU, and Wim, and if I knew how to pronounce it, we will, of Portland State. And both of those letters are public letters in support of 742. And Dave Huben would like to clarify. I'd just like to add, we realized when we sent to you, Nathan, that this joint letter with the presidents of OSU and PSU didn't have a date on it. Just for the record, it was sent March 3rd. Thank you. Now, let me come up here. Hi, you guys. There's cookies over there. Hi, my name's, my name is Edward Olivos, and I'm the department head for education studies. Uh, and this resolution, uh, when Jill brought it up to us, we supported it full-heartedly, all the faculty members and staff there in education studies. And I want to briefly tell you a quick story. I went out to a high school yesterday with a colleague of mine. Uh, we visited a, a local high school. Uh, we were talking to the career counselor, and she was telling us of her first experience working with a uh, Latino student about five, six years ago. And she was giving the student advice on how to uh, apply to college, how to get into uh, uh, the school system, all the financial aid stuff. He had been at the high school the whole time. Uh, unknowing to her, he was undocumented, and the results of her effort was that the student got deported. So she felt horrible about that, being a career counselor, uh, getting her one of her top students deported from uh, a local high school. And since then, she has made it an effort to really reach out and know the laws and to understand what is allowable here in Oregon, and I think that this tuition equity would provide a great opportunity to our local counselors and our local schools on how to advise students who have uh, lived most of their lives here and just need an opportunity to come to school. Thank you very much. Anybody else have a comment, question? I would like to say before we bring this to a vote that this motion is completely student generated. and. And one of the nice things about working this year so closely with the student senate and with the senate leaders and the ASUO leaders is that we have a lot of things in common and we can keep on making those ties and bringing the circle, completing the circle and bringing us together so where we move forward on important issues like this. So let's bring this to a vote. We're going to vote by voice. All in favor of um, adopting, oh, let me just show you what you're voting on. That's what you're voting on to support these three sections, okay? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say nay. All abstained, please say abstained. The motion passes unanimously, and I want to thank the students very much. We now move on to the next 
motion of the day, which is the appointment of officers of administration. And um, to introduce this motion, I'd like to invite Linda King, um, the Human Resources Czar Essa. Thank you. <laughs> then thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm here to talk about the um, new policy appointment of officers of administration. Uh, this policy establishes and defines employment um, appointments for officers of administration. Um, basically, it falls into two kinds of employment for officers of administration indefinite tenure, which uh, are positions that are expected to continue from year to year, and um, uh, a heading titled other, which are those that are of shorter duration, maybe grant funded for a specific time limit uh, project. Um, the new policy provides a provision for um, officers of administration. We're calling it an H contract. Contracts have have letters, and sometimes that makes it easy, easier for us to distinguish. Um, and one of the kind of cornerstone differences is the time an officer of administration gets before um, of non-renewal, that a contract will not be renewed. Currently, we have people with A contracts that have a one-year, up to a one-year notice of non-renewal. Um, we have a number, almost half of our OAs are on what's called F contracts, which has no renewal provision. Um, there's no time period. This new uh, contract, the H contract, would provide one month notice in the first year, three months notice for every year after that. And all new OA appointments will receive um, the H contract with the one and three month notice periods. Um, why did, well, and some other provisions, some features, and how we're going to implement it um, is those officers of administration who have A contracts, that is the contracts that have up to a year's notice, uh, will be grandfathered. So they will be able to retain their A contracts as long as they continue at the university. Um, officers with F contracts, officers of administration with F contracts will be moved to H contracts unless they hold a position that would be short duration um, where that's not appropriate. Um, and all new officer of administration appointments will, will receive the H contract. Why did we do this? Um, one of the primary reasons was consistency. As I said before, we had about half on A contracts and half on F contracts. Um, another was to reduce the financial and organizational um, constraints that are inherent, I inherent, inherent in having uh, one year notice periods, but also at the same time provide reasonable notice periods for officers of administration and to better align our practice in this area with our comparator institutions and institutions with <coughs> OUS and across the country. I want to talk a little bit about this, kind of what we did to, to get to this, this point. Uh, the, we had a rather extensive process meeting with um, the Officer of Administration Council and we have a steering committee for the OA policy initiative. Um, they helped us develop this and other policies. Um, it, uh, so they helped in the initial proposal drafting. We developed a proposal. It wasn't the policy that we ran by um, the leadership council made up of deans and vice presidents. Um, and, of course, the Officers of Administration Council. Um, in January, we have on the HR website a OA policy form where people can comment. And so it was there for the month of January. We held two open forums to discuss the policy with any OA or anyone who wanted to come in later in January. Um, we sh shared the policy the draft, the final draft of the policy on the website in February and March. Um, the final version went up in May. It went to the Faculty Advisory Council in April. 
and we are here today in May, and I believe this will be the final step, I hope. And we're, oh, and we're looking for a July 1st implementation. Thank you, Linda. Um, will you be willing to take questions? Of course. Questions, comments? Is anybody? OK. As always, please state your name. Uh, Melanie Williams, Romance Languages. I um, am having uh, memories of the incident recent in our recent past in OIA, International Affairs, where two key administrators were relieved or given timely notice um, and in a situation that took about five months, I believe, to sort out before they were rightfully retained. And I'm wondering, three months, what happens in a type of situation that could repeat itself where people are being wrongfully dismissed and it takes the university several months to sort out the situation? So with just a three-month time frame, what would happen in a situation like that? Um, well, I don't think that situation was five months. I think it was a, a shorter duration for the decision to be changed. I think it was more like three months. Or January to May, I think. Is okay. Um, so I think that um, any, you know, at any point, if a decision to change uh, the timely notice is to be made, um, it could be made um, you know, even after the end of the period, that that period isn't established as a, a time for, you know, it's a it's a notice period. Um, I think that if there's a decision to rescind it, it could happen during the three month period. It could happen after the period too. Okay. And could I just ask a follow up question? Sure. You said that you put that out to the offices of administration to have um, to respond to this change. Could you talk about the? The um, comments you may have heard, were they mm -hmm. overall positive? Or? Um, on the forum, we had um, various uh, comments. Uh, not a lot saying that they thought the three month wasn't long enough, not, not along along those lines. There were some concerns, some folks who were on F contracts wanted to be switched to A contracts before July 1st. That was a pretty common comment. Um, and there were just, and there were also a number of questions. I th those are the two that kind of come to mind. Maybe Dave can remember some more. David Landrum, I work in the provost's office. I also am the co-chair of this year's Officers of Administration Council. I'd like to echo what Linda said about the participatory um, manner in which this policy has been drafted amongst the OA community, um, both with the OA Council and with town hall meetings. The overall um, impact of this policy is positive. Um, myself, I currently am under an F contract, which gives me no provision. This will actually enhance my benefit by giving me, uh, by providing me with the three months. So all in all, although it's not a perfect solution, it is a very good solution. It is moving forward, and the OA community has had ample opportunity to address this and participate in the process. Thank you, Dave. Does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments? I'm coming, John. Thank you, John Bonine Law School. Uh, just a few uh, perhaps procedural questions. This sounds really minor, but I'm going to ask the first one. Uh, you said there have been previous policies, not just previous contracts, I believe. Or has there been no policy whatsoever? There have been previous policies um, that have been developed as part of um, OA employment policy initiative, like the, the one on performance management. The, the, the reason I'm asking, mm -hmm. and this really sounds picky, but I'm interested in regularity, mm -hmm. I noticed that the resolution coming to us today on classified research uses a form that talks about policy update. And one of the purposes of that form is to show something about changes, whereas this comes with a different form, namely like it's a new policy. Mm -hmm. And there's very little information. Uh, I'm not going to resist it going forward, but mm -hmm. there's very little information here, apart from what you said orally, about the previous policies. So I just, I, I note that, and, and I wonder if that's just the way it's going to be, or the way it is in this situation, or because the process was so robust with the Officer Administration mm -hmm. Council and so forth, that it was felt there's no need to sort of furthermore uh, 
tell the Senate in writing as opposed to your oral presentation mm -hmm. how things are being changed and why? I, th I think there may be a misunderstanding. When I talked about other policies, they weren't other versions of this policy. Mm -hmm. They were completely different policies. I was just referring to it as an ongoing policy review, and there will be probably other policies. Um, in terms of the uh, form and the documentation and how it comes forward to the University Senate, this is my first time doing it, so you know maybe there was some additional um, documentation that needed to be no, prepared. No, no, it's, it's not. It's actually not a, not a problem of that. It's a, more the internal process. And if there was not a previous policy, university policy in the policy library, then you've done the right thing because there is nothing and this is where it is. I'm just trying to clarify that. My other questions are this. Um, I noticed that there is this exclusion clause, or let's call it the grandfather clause, that says that people who already have contracts that might give them one year, two years, mm. three years. One year, one year. Mm -hmm. And there are no contracts right now that give more than one year in the university system? Yeah, that's correct. This Now we're talking about the time of notice that a contract right. won't be renewed. Yes. Somebody may get a two-year contract. But, but there's no notice periods longer than one year. That's any correct. Place. As far as I understand, yeah, that's Can correct. You, but those who do have up to one year will continue for the life of their work at the university to get one year? That's correct, as long as so they're that, an officer of administration. So that, uh, and uh, it's not clear to me why uh, you wouldn't eventually r get rid of that grandfather, except perhaps they feel that they've made some reliance on, I want to have one year mm -hmm. forever. Uh, if so, how many people are in that category who will not be subject to the three-month rule but to a longer rule? What percentage or number? About half of our OAs have those longer contracts. And I think it was, the decision was made, um, this is an issue about which OAs care deeply. And I think that it was part of the university's commitment that for those officers of administration who had the one-year contract, that that wasn't going to be changed, that we were going to continue that commitment that was, when they entered the OA workforce, that was the commitment that was made to them. Okay, thank you. I think John brings up a good point, though. These policies, so this is one of these policies that is going to be put on the policy library and will go into force if and when it's adopted. It doesn't have a lot of background, and I think that's what you were asking for. And we haven't asked for the background in writing, but I think it's useful to have that background in writing. So in the future, we will ask for all of these policies to have some background so people have a context. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let me show you what we're voting on. We are voting on adopting this policy, and the specific wording is that the University Senate adopts the policy on the appointments of officers of administration and forwards it for the university to the university president for his action on behalf of the university. Okay? And so just to be clear, we are adopting this policy. We're affirmatively legislating this policy into effect, if you choose, okay? And I'm gonna make this, I say this and it's not necessary, but it's important to realize that the Senate needs to vote affirmatively and then if the President chooses to veto it, he has to come back and explain why to us and then to the statutory faculty. So all in favor of this policy, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say nay. All abstain, please say abstain. I hear one abstention and other uh, no no's. The rest were yeses. So this two abstentions, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Several more abstentions. Four total. Thank you. The policy passes. And um, I want to thank the OA Council for their approval and their review of it. And I want to thank the administration and Linda for bringing it to us for adoption. Thank you. We now move on to the next item on the agenda. We have a lot. And the next item on the agenda is actually 
tabled. This is an adoption of the policy of classified research, and it's tabled to next year. Let me tell you what has happened to, has l that led to this tabling. The university assembly in 1967 passed a resolution stating that there should be no classified research on this campus. By classified, they meant secret research, research that was not open for publication and for dissemination in public. The, that has been our policy right through to today, and it will continue. The Office of Research has decided to update this policy because it's a few years old. So they updated it, coming up with new language, and the language had a few problems with it. One problem was that the, the, um, it, it talked about federal funding of classified research, but excluded the possibility of private funding of class, classified research. So that was reworded and brought back to us. However, there's other problems with this particular um, motion, including, and then not surprisingly, what the word secret means, OK? and how it's interpreted. And at the moment, it is in the hands of the university council to try and sort out these sorts of definitions. Because none of us felt comfortable bringing this to this body at its, in, in its present form, where it was uncertain what it actually meant, we have asked for it to be tabled. It will come back, hopefully, in language that's clearer and plainer next year. Thank you, John Bonine Law. Nonetheless, uh, I, I would like you to tell a little more about the process of, of where the, you know, how this is happening outside the um, research office, how the Senate or S Senate executive or whoever is involved, because you'll be off the presidential position. And I think it's important for all of us to know how this will continue to be uh, bird dogged, and in particular, um, not knowing it was going to be tabled, I did a side-by-side -side comparison of the 1967 policy and the proposal that was put here, and, and there are a number of differences, and my concern is that there is absolutely nothing in the documents provided to the Senate saying that those differences exist. In fact, the policy update uh, uh, that was provided said nothing about, well, we decided to change the word classified to secret, top secret, confidential. We decided to remove the phrase about uh, private research, private members. Uh, we decided to remove the word equipment and only have resources. Every one of those changes could have an implication or not. And I want to, in addition to knowing the procedure that that you will tell us will continue to go on, which is useful. I, I want to ask those in the administration to, this is consistent with what we talked about just a little bit ago, to provide context, background, and specific, every time there's a change in a really fundamental policy in this university, and I think the 1967 policy was fundamental, we should know exactly why each phrase is being changed and instead what we have is a document, uh, an agenda document, uh, that says this is simply updated because of periodic review of policy to ensure relevance, accuracy, and compliance with federal and state regulations. I doubt very seriously that every change was done in order to comply with the regulation, whereas the previous one didn't. And it's very common and easy to say, well, everything we're doing is just a periodic review, but I really, as a senator, want to know why is X being changed to Y or to not X or to half of X. So if I could make that request in general to the administration and in addition ask you to address the procedural consultation. So those are good points, and let me just tell you about the procedure. What we've done with all policies is for the, is the basic rule that the Senate and the administration have to agree on the policy. To reach that goal, the policy, which is almost always drafted by the administration, comes to the Senate. Now, the first place it goes to is the Senate president. And then it goes to the Senate exec. And if the Senate president and the Senate exec think that there's some virtue to bringing this to the Senate, then it goes to the Senate. And it gets posted ahead of time. In this particular case, 
several senators identified problems with the original drafting of the motion, problems that you've just identified. Okay, they were brought to my attention. I sent them back to the administration. The administration says, hmm, we didn't really realize this. They rewrote it. It came back in a second form. We posted it again. The same people looked at it and said, but there's some more problems. And it now is back in the administration court, okay? This iterative process, which I think is a positive one, is, um, will continue. However, because this has gone back and forth twice, the administration and Lynette Schenkel, who's the person who's sort of carrying this forward, has agreed to actually establish a faculty committee to actually review this document and to go into details about its origin and what's changed between 67 and now and to give the kind of background that you're talking about and the side-by-side -side comparison and the rational and the justification for what changes have occurred and why. So that committee will be established. That committee will review the verbiage that's presented by the administration, perhaps revise it, and then bring it to the Senate. That's the process for this particular res uh, policy. Thank you. It's, uh, as I understand the process as well, and I uh, want to keep us, particularly the new senators, knowing what's happening so that we keep this in our sights. What I would do, though, is in addition to asking the administration, I would ask you or whoever interacts with that committee to request that the, uh, there be a more robust explanation, not just of why the policy is, but the change, that it be documented, and I presume that's going to happen. You betcha. Robert, did you want to say something? I saw your hand up. This is our esteemed president-elect. Um, thank you, John, for bringing up those points. And I uh, was going to ask a question that then Nathan answered. And then another one occurred to me. Uh, is there a way that we could put into practice um, some format which would request that any motion about a changed policy that comes to us is accompanied by this material. In other words, in the initial phase of receiving it, there would need to be an explanation of indeed what has been changed and the reasons for that, and that would be policy. And I think that that's a good thing to do, and we probably can pass a motion on this, but. Since we're rewriting the Constitution, perhaps we can put it in the Constitution as well. So we make it absolutely clear that the information needs to be brought forward to us. So either way, I don't think it's a good idea for us to keep reinventing the wheel every time. So your, your point is well taken. And I'm sure as Senate President, you can help make that happen. But I'll, I'll be long gone, distantly long gone. Hold on, we have another. This is the longest discussion of a tabled motion in history. Uh, Dean Walton, University of Oregon Libraries. Um, are we also talking about proprietary uh, commercial research? So today I learned that there's no official definition of secret. There's no legal definition of secret. Let me put it that way. And there is no legally accepted definition of proprietary. So the wording in this policy had to do with secret proprietary research, which somehow causes a little problem. And fortunately, we have smart faculty members who pointed that out. And it's not just to be nitpicky. It's actually because this is really important for this campus. So I appreciate all of them for doing this. But this. You know, the issue here is how we can all come together to come to an agreement on, on somewhat of a sticky problem and allow our research to go on and at the same time not violate moral or ethical <laughs> rules that we have for our community. And sometimes that takes a little time. We've gone back and forth twice. Now we're going to have a committee that will look into it. Anybody else? Well, with that, we... Um, officially are tabling this motion, and it will come back. So for those of you who are here next year, you will see it again. That leads us to the next issue, which is the 
ever popular spring curriculum report. And to update us on all of this, we have the ever popular and amazingly hardworking Paul Engelking, who's the chair of the Committee on Courses. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, preliminary curriculum report. Uh, we've had some editing since uh, you um, first got to review this on the website uh, with some later changes, uh, that mistakes that are corrected and such. Actually, if we can go to page 18, uh, page 17, actually. We can find page 17 or so. This, we're going to product design. Uh, okay, product design, uh, PD 323, we corrected the repeat once, and it's maximum of eight credits. So the red is, uh, is what we are proposing, okay? N uh, next page in education, uh, there's a title change. And this is Education uh, 611, Survey of Educational Research Methods. Uh, it's effective 2011 summer. The next change that comes up, uh, we're going to have to zip back to page 5. Sorry about this. This is the order they came in. Okay, it's going to be uh, add environmental studies. There's a whole big red section. Environmental studies, ease. We're doing this for your entertainment here. Okay, uh, we ac accidentally missed this, and so we're inserting the changes to environmental studies in here. Um, one that we approved in, in committee, but ha didn't make it to the report. Um, up to page three, uh, anthropology four, fifteen five fifteen. So it's if anybody wants an aspirin, just let me know. We yeah. have them here okay. too. Uh, we accidentally moved the line from above down below to approve to satisfy category C. That's inappropriate. So strike that. English, 455. Uh, we just added the words U of O administrative action so that you know how it was done. Um, we what, also is, what is U of O administrative action? So for those of us who okay. are not familiar with all of this? Uh, the committee has delegated to uh, people like the registrar or so the authority to uh, uh, make changes and bring them to us that we would then ratify here on the floor of the Senate. So we would okay them in committee and then they would be brought to you. But they were pretty much changes that are routine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, we just changed the alphabetization of psychology and physics, which we don't need to go to. Um, classics, in classics, we changed the effective term to be fall 2012. And um, on page 19, we changed some night numbers on ed led courses. Um, so we go to page 19. We discovered that some of the numbers had actually been used before, and so the purpo the one you can see highlighted there in red. Okay, <coughs> so those are the major changes that we're making now to the report, introducing on the floor of the Senate. Um, I would like to bring to your attention some things that we did as policy, and if we go to page 32, The Gen Ed section, oh, let's see, it's, um, 
actually there. Submitting course proposals roll down a little bit, and there will be a highlight. There will be a there it is in italics. Um, <clears throat> it was brought to our attention that we have a, a difficulty um, in that um, general education courses are generally approved by ICR after they've gone through all um, um, reviews, and uh, some, that we don't have a way of introducing something like a 410 or a 199 or a 399. And sometimes these gen ed courses are time sensitive. For example, the Williams Council finishes its business in uh, May, and uh, that often will approve a course that would qualify for general education, but we can't get it onto the books because the Senate doesn't meet in the summer. Um, I have authority, um, and the provost in my absence has the authority while the the, our committee isn't meeting to make emergency temporary approvals for things. We tried this last summer with a course, and um, it was enough running around, and I felt uncomfortable taking the authority for ICR itself on my shoulders. Um, we've discussed this in a number of places, ICR committee, the uh, Intercollege General Education Requirements Committee. Um, we've run it by the undergraduate um, council, and uh, what we'd like to do is make a, have introduced numbers, 100, an even 100, or an even 300, to be available for ICR to designate these courses that while they're being reviewed, they would be, um, it would be possible to give them general emergency general education credit. So just want to make sure that you understand that because this would be a policy decision. Continuing on that, in page 39, there's a section on the general education requirements. It's the boilerplate for general education. I think we, I think we just missed it. There it is, yes, okay. So let's go down to the requirements themselves, which is three, I believe, section three. Okay, so we're adding, adding in here section 3.3 at the discretion of the intercollege committee, a course that has been submitted for review specified under 3.1, which is um, the whole review procedure, may be taught for general edge credit once under temporary course number while it's being reviewed. We just told you what those course numbers would be. If the intercollege committee initially reviews it and determines the course would meet the criteria of paragraphs one and two as initially proposed. Okay? Now, another thing that came to our attention was that we were asked uh, about the policy for a temporary multi-listed courses. Multi-listing a course allows the course to be taught under two different subject codes. Um, we've had this policy available on the books, and I think it's the page just before this. Right. Okay, so go up to the top up there. Okay. To explain what multi-listing is, um, some courses can be cross-listed. When we hold the, the, use the word cross-listed, meaning that the course has one subject code and number, but in the catalog, that co course could also be listed under a, a different department. So for example, I know this happens in biology and chemistry. One of the chemistry courses is actually listed in the, in the list of courses for biology, and, the, and you are referred to the description in the chemistry section. There is also a procedure that's been on the books uh, since May 13th, 1998, of multi-listing the courses, and this is where you use one or more, actually you'd have to use more than one, two or more subject codes for the course. Uh, there would be a home department for it in that the full catalog description would be given under one department and the others would refer back to it, but it would still have the subject code of the other department. Um, so in implementing this, 
it was brought to our attention that there's no way to, to make this happen rapidly uh, for using something like a 410 or 199 or th uh, 399. So the registrar came up with a way of doing this, again using specialized numbers for the multi-listing courses that could be used and deployed rapidly. So um, just want to make sure that everyone understands that the credit, student credit hours for a multi-listed course or a team-taught course go by the faculty line of the faculty members teaching it not by the subject codes of the course itself. So uh, if, if uh, a Martian taught one of our courses, the, the credit would go to Mars, okay, regardless of what subject it was taught under. So everyone should understand this, because there's a lot of concern about the codes on the course and where the credit goes and things like that. It goes by the faculty line. So everyone OK with that? That's how it works. OK. So uh, for, for, um, for any term that a course will be taught by more than one instructor, the percentage of each faculty member's responsibility for the course must be specified in advance of registration. And Banner requires that. So we put that in there. Now going down to nine, each multi-listed multi multi course is denoted by an M suffix to the course number. A course may have only one suffix letter. And number 10, temporary multi-listed courses may be offered without formal course approval only once under the numbers 200M, 400M, 500M, or 600M. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, are there any comments, changes? Thank you. Um, so without further ado, I think it's time to vote on this. And let me just show you what we're voting on. Should be the bottom of the first page. Right, but we have a motion. Oh, yeah. And so the motion is to adopt the spring curriculum report. OK? And so that's this part here. So going to do is vote on that now. All in favor of adopting the spring curriculum report, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say nay. All abstain, please say abstain. The motion passes unanimously. And I'm. this is 42 pages of this kind of stuff. Somebody has to do it. And we need to thank Paul and the committee. For they meet every two weeks. Um, I just want to thank you very much for that. Um, it is my birthday today, so I'm realizing I'm, I'm becoming superannuated. And so I feel a little bit like George Washington when uh, he was congratulated and such, and he brought out his glasses to point, put on his, uh, his bifocal glasses. I think he had bifocals. Ben Franklin was around at the time. And so someone's going to have to take this job over for me. So. If, if you've got any volunteers, please speak up, speak up now. I, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Paul. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Never say that the Senate is always serious but we're always heartfelt. With that, I need to move on to the um, next section of our meeting, which is actually the discussion of the Distinguished Service Awards. This is the only time of the year that we actually have to go into executive session, so I'm going to have to ask everybody who is not a voting member of the Senate to please leave the room. Stand outside, we shall take about 10 minutes. Well, since people are moving, let's, well, since everybody's got their coats, okay, let's do this first. Thank you for reminding me. You stay. You stay. You can sit. 
What we'll be doing now is talking about the Distinguished Service Awards. Dave Hubin is the chair of this award committee. We will be talking about specific individuals, everything that we talk about in this room now. You're going to turn off the video, please, and the audio. of session, and we move to the last item on the new business, which is the announcement of the university election, the results of the University of Election. And for that, I'd like to bring up our distinguished and esteemed executive coordinator of the Senate, Chris Prosser, who will just say a very brief few words. Thank you, Nathan. So we've had the election. It ran for two weeks and it was ended on Friday at 5 p.m. Uh, I think it went pretty well. and. I've posted today the names of all the senators who were elected from all the CAS, professional schools, uh, classified staff, and OAs, and also all of the elected committees and the people who were elected. So this information can be found on the Senate homepage under the latest news link. And it'll be up for a while. That's about it. Any questions? If not, I want to thank Chris. This is his first time doing this. This is not an easy job of getting this all organized, and he's done a fantastic job, and he's lost a few hairs over the result of it, And but he's done a great job. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for your help. <laughs> to the... Um, to the next section of the agenda. And this is the section where we normally have a um, open discussion, but we had no open discussion planned for this time because some of us knew we would spend a lot of time on the motions. So we have no open discussion today. Instead, we move straight on to reports, and I'd like to bring up um, Ali Amami. Michelle Henney is not here, I believe, because she's teaching. And so Ali, who is the co-chair of the NTTF committee, will um, give us a report. And I want to thank him for being so patient. We had planned for him to do this last time, but we never got around to it. So Ali, here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm uh, reporting on the last year's, or actually 2010, 2011, activities uh, for our committee, NTTF committee, uh, on the behalf of the committee. Um, first thing is that over the last five years, we have seen continuous positive changes in NTTF's affairs due to the excellent works of many groups and people, especially the university academic affairs, deans, head. Uh, department heads, and at all times, I want to mention this, that Academic Affairs consulted us and incorporated comments and recommendations from NTTF Senate Committee in creating a very special and important document, which is uh, basically on the, U on the university's uh, NTTF policies, and the document titled U <coughs> UO policies on NTTF, which is dated uh, November uh, 12, 2007, and it's posted on the Academic Affairs website. And uh, this document defines uh, career and adjuncts NTTFs and establishes guidelines uh, for NTTF appointments, ranks and titles, salary and compensations, evaluations and promotions, standing, and also having access to dispute resolutions. The previous chairs and members of the Senate, um, and Senate NTTF Committee deserves special recognitions in their reviews and hard works in creating this document. Currently, Academic Affairs is completing the activations of the rank of lecturer <coughs> and reclassification of, <coughs> excuse me, of academic librarians from OS status to NTTFs. 
and associated ranks and titles, and the establishments of the professors, professor of practice uh, category for adjunct faculty who have attained significant prominence in their uh, respective fields or disciplines. This process is currently in the hands of OL OUS. Current accomplishments include working with academic affairs on the review and revisions of the NTTF evaluation and promotion process draft, which is a draft document, and uh, the suggestions of a committee and consistent with the president's commitment uh, to the improvements of salaries for all and classified staffs, TTFs, NTTFs, and OAs. Uh, Academic Affairs is undertaking review of salaries across campus and in comparison to our AAU uh, comparator schools. Uh, committee is in the process of conducting a survey of NTTF to determine their awareness of the existence of the 2007 document, NTTF policy document and its implications. Future issues include the development of the unit specific s standards and statements regarding the evaluation and promotion of NTTFs and the process by which these criteria statements will be created, reviewed and approved. Second, providing a unified standard for the process of hiring adjuncts to assure consistency, fairness, and openness. The main objective is to assure that the job or the position defines the appointment and that academic degree does not define the position. Third, discussion on the length of contracts for career NTTFs. It's currently is one year and two years for senior instructors and hopefully could be extended to uh, probably more than one year. The fourth, discussions of the wisdom merit of the creation of an elected committee for the evaluation and promotion and retention of NTTF similar to that of uh, FPC for the uh, uh, tenure track faculties. And the survey is probably this week is gonna go out uh, soon or maybe it's already out. So we request that all the NTTFs please to respond to that as soon as possible. And I'm open to any questions if you have any. Melanie Williams, Romance Languages. Um, thank you for your report, Ali. I am curious about timelines. So I, I hear talk about implementing senior instructor two and lecturer positions, but I, in our department, we haven't heard, at least the instructors haven't heard anything about when those will be implemented. Is there, do we know what the timeline is for implementing senior instructor two lecturer positions and, and where the discussions are with salary increases and all that? Okay. The, uh, what do you mean by instructor two? Do you mean senior? Senior instructor two, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the senior instructor is, is all depends on the NTTF themselves. They can apply for it and they can write a letter to their head departments and they say that they are ready for, for, the level for promotion. Two. For level two, senior uh, instructor two? Uh, I, I believe so. Uh, Ken probably can jump into that. Uh, Ken Dotson from Academic Affairs. I'm not 100% certain about senior two. Um, I'm, I'm sort of three quarters wanting to tell you that that, that is an internal matter for us and, and we can proceed with those considerations. There's a tiny part of me, well I guess one quarter, it's not tiny, that, that says that, that I should double check that to make sure that we're not waiting for OUS to give us approval for, for senior instructor two or research assistant associate senior two. Um, I know we're still waiting for the OUS's final ruling on the lecturer positions. I would just like to say that I would like to ask you and your colleagues in academic affairs to send both Melanie and directly and to the Senate um, the answer to that question, okay, when you have it, okay? It's important for us to know it, so thank you. And 
I have a follow-up question just because I found a PowerPoint on the Academic Advice website from something you've done in the fall, and it talks about um, allowing NTTF to be eligible for sab sabbatical and things like that, and I'm wondering timelines about any of this, because it, it's nice to hear these this being discussed, but it, it'd be really useful for instructors to know what they're facing. I'm going to stand up for this one. Ken Doxy again from Academic Affairs. There, there are some interesting questions that, that arise as we're looking at, at implementing this policy. Ali mentioned one of the big ones, I think, and that is should there be an FPC-type committee? Um, maybe I was actually interested in getting the sense of the Senate on that, but I think we're running pretty late today. Um, what I think the committee is going to do is, is put to forth basically two proposals, one of which would call for that sort of committee, one of which wouldn't, and and we'll see what people think. I, I waffle on it myself. I, I, in the, I, can, I can see conceptually that it makes sense. At the same time, here's something I did want to say that, uh, about the NTTF promotion process. I, I don't think they're going to be problematic promotions. Our, our NTTF as we hear on on year-to-year -year contracts, as it's uh, those of you on year-to-year -year contracts know, every year you are evaluated by your your colleagues who are deciding whether or not to issue another contract. And so, when it comes time to be considered for promotion, I think I'm hoping people will see it as an opportunity, not as a risk. And and we'll talk more about the timing of events and and risk and things like that later, perhaps. I've, I've gotten sufficiently off on a tangent that you need to remind me where sabbaticals. Okay, <laughs> there, are, there are other things I think as well. The, the, the implementation says that, that senior NTTF will be eligible for sabbatical under the same considerations that tenure track faculty and tenured faculty are for sabbatical. One is that it's a, it's a, it's a period of time for professional development, not just a year away. Um, and the second is that tenured faculty face the same thing. They, if they request a sabbatical at a time when their department can't afford to have them gone, their, their request is not always approved. And, and actually, I, it, when I think about the practicalities of NTTF, and particularly in the instructional ranks, and think about how a sabbatical nests onto that, I get confused. But in the abstract, I think it's, it's the concept. So, so in terms of the timing of all these things, one other big timing thing, um, should NTTF promotions be on a standard clock, just like tenure track faculty are, where deans here in the spring, here's the list of faculty who are coming up, departments start preparing files, there's, there's a set sequence of events culminating in the May 1st announcement, or a little bit earlier this year, of, of all promotions and tenures. S tenure decisions have to be done legally by June 15th. Promotions of NTTF have no legal requirement. There's an ethical and a moral and sort of just a, a personal sort of thing where you'd like people to know. Um, but we don't have that strict time pressure. <coughs> Two limiting things the committee is looking at. Should we go to a standard schedule for all promotion tenure for NTTF, or I'm sorry, promotion for NTTF, or should we simply continue with the rotating submit when it's ready, it will be considered in a timely manner. Um, and I will, I think what we'll do is, is in the interest of time, not do this now, but our hope is within a very short period of time to post for comment a document that interprets the policy in terms of practicalities. What does this really mean? What does the sabbatical mean? What about the timing? Um, what, is the, what does a promotion dossier look like? It's, uh, things like that. John in the, the law school you know, the document, as it's currently said, calls for 18 terms. Well, that's because it's the, the quarter-centric people who wrote the document, the law schools on semesters. So we're, we're trying to address all of those things in this implementation statement that I hope will be available for comment really, really soon. So if I would like to just say that, that all of these things are really important, and all of, we're making a lot of progress in this. I established the NTTF committee back when I was Senate president nine years ago, and we've done a really good job. But none of the policies for NTTF have come through the Senate. And it is important from now on that every policy, 
every NTTF policy, because it's an academic issue, has to be approved by the Senate. And I include in that the implementation explanation of the current policy, which was not approved by the Senate. So I will ask formally that everything regarding the NTTF now come through the Senate, the same way that everything regarding tenure track faculty come through, NT through the Senate. I wish to remind everybody here that in the last, since 1990, the number of faculty members, tenure-related faculty members, has gone from 650 to 675, even though the number of our students have gone from 17,000 to 24,000. The number of NTTF have gone up from under 200 to over 350. And this is a significant group of people who have dedicated their lives to this university, and it's really important that the Senate helps them feel comfortable at this university. So I appreciate your efforts, but I ask that they come here. Just, just two comments. One is if I read you through my four pages of notes, just in case Ali wasn't able to be here, the final thing tells you that the next thing we'll do is bring this implementation plan to the Senate. Yeah. Um, and your numbers, I think sometimes we forget about NTTF being not just instructors, but also research assistants, research associates. In fact, we have well over 600 NTTF. Right, correct. I was referring specifically to the instructional faculty component of that. I agree. Thank you. There's a couple of other questions. We're going to go here first and then over there. Tell us who you are. Uh, Cassia Delabeau, um, School of Architecture, Allied Arts. I was also involved in the early NDTF work and the 2007 um, policy, and um, you and I might revisit how that all came down. But anyway, because um, that's not my memory. Uh, the piece that got left behind for us to bring that policy to the Senate was also addressing the folks who work, the adjunct faculty who work under 0.5. And as I understand it, that's still a large group of people that the committee has not uh, been able to take uh, into a more proactive uh, approach in terms of addressing issues of work environment, access to resources, et cetera. And so I was just wondering if you have an update about that uh, and if there are any plans to be able to take that group on as well. As far as the committee knows, uh, they are on different contracts, I believe. They are in the uh, D contracts, whereas the careers are on the C contracts. And by definition, according to that document, uh, they, they, you know, they're going to be about uh, 0.5 or under 0.5 FTE. Um, as far as I know, uh, hasn't you know? I don't know anything about whether they are going to be, whether they are going to be a part of you know the. Uh I just Cassia Delabeau, the uh, School of Architecture, Allied Arts. I just would like to make put this on record that that is an urgent group that needs to be addressed, and I was afraid they would be left not belonging to any group, and I would just like to put that out, that that's a group that still needs some attention around work conditions, and just because they're not classified anymore as NTTF formally as 0.5 and above, that that's still a very large group of participating um, uh, professionals that make our campus work, and I think it's really important to get that on the record, that they need to be addressed, and if the committee feels that it's not appropriate for them, then I think the Senate needs to come back and say, wow, this is a group we need to not forget, and let's get another group together and call it the, um, I won't say what, so <laughs> the adjunct would, committee. Would you please be more specific what the committee wants, uh, wants to, uh, you want them to do? I, I think the committee has done an excellent job continuing moving forward with the working conditions and um, salary issues, sabbatical issues, all those important pieces. There is a group of people who are not, who are, point five, who are under 0.5, who are still w in working conditions where they're hired only up to 0.49, or their salaries are not uh, comparable with peers within the same school, or they are asked to have office hours with students and they don't have an office, or they don't have a key to get into the classroom. I mean, many very small, things that they need in order to be able to do their work. And we they just don't have representation, and that in many pockets 
uh, around the campus from the surveys in the past, we had many people uh, have, have very serious issues about this. And I've been curious when that group was going to be attended to. Thank you. So let me just mention the fact that those of us in CAS don't experience this very much, but most of the professional schools hire professionals to come and teach one class yeah. every once in a while. Yeah. This is the group of people that, we s that we're talking about, and that includes all, all the professional schools on campus. It's not an insignificant amount of number of people. And so we should, as we're moving forward with trying to improve working conditions for the various groups on this campus, this particular group should not be left behind. Sure. Yeah. That's all. This is Hayender Karkalsa from Romance Languages. I have a question about promotion. Um, as I understand, only career instructors can be up for promotion, but we have a pool of instructors who can be eligible, but because there isn't a career instructor position they can be hired for, they uh, then they will not have this opportunity. How, how do you uh, think of handling such situations? Well, by definition, they are temporary, according to the document, they are temporary uh, you know, staff or faculties that they are hired, and uh, there is uh, there are no criteria for you know for them to have a career path to be promoted. If they have been uh, teaching full time for uh, three years, okay, and they they will be hired, I but if they're not hired as a career instructor, how is this going to work? Uh, I th I think that there are policies that that if they want to be hired for, you know, as a career, then they have to go through a national uh, search based on the document and, and, you know, request for, you know, for a promotion to be hired for, you know, uh, as a career. So there is possibility for them, but they have to engage in a national search. It's a different kind of appointment and a uh, different kind of application and review process, as I understand it. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions? Ken, do you do you you seem to be itching to say something? Hold on. <coughs> so two quick perhaps clarifications. One, the, the part time NTTF. Um, I need to to explore with with the committee about whether this. The one thing in particular I wanted to mention was the point four nine FTE appointments, which which in most cases one can infer why the, a 0.49 is made instead of a 0.5. Insurance, right? Benefits. Um, academic Affairs in general does not think that's a sound policy. Academic Affairs signs contracts. And I believe you'll find questions increasingly raised about 0.49 FTEs. Okay. Regarding the, the, the career and adjunct, adjunct appointments are by definition of limited duration. I mean, all NTTF are of duration as, as needs of the university generate the position. Adjuncts, however, are, are on, a, on a three years maximum period of time. If you're currently an adjunct and you've been an adjunct for a long time, the rules are changing, <coughs> it's entirely possible if you've been an adjunct for a long time that your department, in fact, or your unit has needs for a career position. If they announced a career position, an adjunct is certainly eligible to apply. One might even think an adjunct who's been in the position for a long time would have an advantage, a competitive edge in a, in a competitive search. Okay. But to be eligible for longer term appointments and for promotion, you do need to be in a, in a career track. Okay. If you've been in a career track for a while and you know, are wondering how this would happen, again, let's uh, we'll explain it to you later, but I think we ha I think the committee has a really, really sound plan for how to work to phase that process in with what I hope will be no anxiety whatsoever. But I recognize if I may add, uh, uh, just a note that one of the purposes of this survey is just to know that. How many of you have people there, you know, with adjunct position that they don't know how to convert, you know, to a, a career position? So we're running out of time, and so I'm going to have to draw this to a close. But this is a very important issue, and we should not stop this conversation now. So I recommend that anybody who has any questions, send them to me.
as Senate President, Dali as the chair of the, of the group of the NTTF committee, and to academic affairs, and I'm sure Ken would be happy to address them. And if you send it to all of us, then we can start getting a list of answers to these questions that we can promulgate publicly. So I want to thank the NTTF committee for an excellent job. Finally, it's time to adjourn. Before we do that, though, we have to go through this quick exercise of asking, is there any notices of motion? This is the time when they're done. If I hear none, I therefore call this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Oh, before you go, let me just remind you that we have another Senate meeting on the 25th, okay? And that meeting is essential. We haven't finished our business this year, so please come to that meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>